Right. Good morning. Thanks very much for the uh, invitation. We're always told not to apologise or say sorry at the beginning of a talk, but looking out the window there, the wildflowers are lovely, the pollen isn't. So I do have a cough and a bit of a, a, a sneeze at times. So apologies if my voice croaks at times. So, oops. I've changed my, the title a little bit from what I was asked to, to cover. But what I really want to talk about is the approach that we're building up in National Grid, which we're calling the Natural Grid. It's an approach which aims to use our land holdings for and natural assets for the benefit of biodiversity, ecosystems and communities. As an organisation, we've got quite a good history of doing this kind of stuff anyway. But over the past probably two and a half years, this is now in being coming embedded as a theme in the, our organisation's strategy. So how do we enhance ecosystems alongside our energy assets? I'm not going to be able to tell a full story, but I'll sh hopefully show you some of the principles, some of the progress we're making there. But at the heart of this is really recognising, starting to recognise the value that nature brings to our organisation, but how we share that value with stakeholders, with our neighbours and with communities as well. So what I'd like to do is show you some examples of how that's coming to life, but also point us to where we need to go and hopefully how we build up more of a collaborative and more of a partnership approach to nature, to the environment, around our assets. So just before I start, I thought I'd just put up this slide just to show you a little bit about, a little bit more about National Grid. You've probably heard quite a bit about this from Hector Pearson on Monday. But we have both gas and electricity networks. They cover the whole of Great Britain, from the north of Scotland down to the, the south of Cornwall and Devon. And a few numbers up there, around about 7,000 kilometres of overhead line, perhaps the most visible uh, element of our systems. About the same of underground gas transmission pipeline, and add the two together, we've got roughly that in gas distribution pipelines in the sort of grey area in the middle of the country. But we also have quite a significant land holding. All those networks are connected by hubs, our gas compressor sites, our electricity substations, and each of those has a land holding associated with it. Could be as small as a couple of hectares, could be up to 50, and in some places 200 hectares. So there's quite a, a land holding that uh, we can start thinking about in different ways. We also have a surplus asset, surplus uh, land portfolio around about 650 uh, land holdings there. Again, the roughly the same sorts of sizes. So quite a proposition there in terms of how can we start using some of those land holdings in the natural grid approach to start embedding some of these ideas about how can we create better, bigger, more connected spaces for nature and community as part of this national grid approach. And I'm sure that's a picture that Hector put up. Uh, there's the AONBs with our electricity system uh, superimposed. So there are very, actually very few uh, of the organisations represented here where our systems, our land holdings don't interact. But before I go on to really talking about how we're building up this natural grid approach, I thought it would be worth just looking from our perspective at why nature is important, why the environment is important to, to us. I heard a great talk from, from Matt, and particularly love that uh, Kevin Spacey piece, the first time I've heard that, really starts crystallising some of the reasons why nature is important to us all. But as an organisation, we are really dependent on fully functioning ecosystems, both at a local but also at a landscape level. So up in the top there, water, really important, particularly water, too much of it in the wrong place. That's uh, our sub one of our substations in Gloucestershire in 2010. Water, electricity don't mix very well indeed uh, at all. Um, down below there, you may not be able to see from the back, but one of our pylons, towers we tend to call them, and an area of landslip here. Um, threat, risk to our system, and 
in some ways, we have an engineered solution there. We pour concrete. But nature actually does this adaptation to these kinds of risks well, so are there alternative uh, solutions uh, that we could think about? Uh, sorry, wrong way. Matt also mentioned climate change, clearly a great risk uh, uh, to society as a whole, but to our system. There's risks there from increasing frequency of severe weather uh, events, flood, wind, ice storms and so on, and the, the rather dramatic picture of lightning there is meant to represent that. But really where it all takes us to is how we work with our stakeholders, how we value the, the natural environment there, but how we actually work to put the right, uh, make the right decisions around it. So the picture there is, is about stakeholders, and stakeholder expectations of organisations, their stewardship of the environment are changing, and quite rightly, more is expected of us, and we try and, and make progress. People make up their minds about organisations by the way they look after their, their natural assets, their natural capital. Investors take notice of it, and certainly in terms of recruiting new people, the brightest people, uh, the most able uh, recruits tend to be attracted to organisations, whichever sector they're in, which do have good sustainability or environmental credentials as well. So important there. And for us, it's been great in terms of uh, identifying some real passion out in our people as well, bringing to life some of their understanding, some of their wishes to uh, do things there as well. So this is starting to change our view of our assets. And Here's our sort of conventional view for our assets, the engineering assets, the pipes and the wires, and they happen to go through an environment. But our view is changing that we really need to start thinking about those natural assets as well. The trees which give us screening, uh, the watercourses which help manage uh, water flows, flood risk and so on, the habitats, the woodlands uh, um, that are a benefit to others and it may just be you know, just a nice place for people to, to walk their dogs or just enjoy a bit of green space. So what we really want to do is start thinking about how we value these assets, how we incorporate them in some of our decision making and how we can work with others to bring that value to, to life. But in a way that delivers value to us, it's got to make business sense to us, but also drives new value for our stakeholders and our neighbours. So how do we start doing that? And here's a, an overhead view, an aerial photograph of one of our substations in Worcestershire. And the red line is the boundary of our, whoops. The red line is the boundary of our ownership there. And the engineering assets are, are the bit and the, the sort of gray bit in the middle. And we have sort of meadows right there we have trees for visual screening uh, for the properties uh, down to the south of that view there. We've got ponds, we've got hedges, um, which provide vital services to us in terms of screening, in terms of security, in terms of water management. But the secret to really unlocking the value there is for us to look over the fence. What does that land mean in a local and regional context? How can we understand our if there are ways to change the management of that land in a way that preserves the value to us but also helps others deliver some of their ambition as well, um, be it around local, regional or regional priorities for habitats, for particular species or for communities who could find another use like for, for that land could be something like allotments. And that's the really at the heart of how we're trying to build up this natural grid approach. And the slide, the next slide, I'm having real problems with this. This slide shows the, the process which really sits behind what we're, we're trying to do. Up in the top uh, left-hand corner there is recognition that over the past year, 18 months, we have taken the steps to actually understand value and account for our natural capital and our ecosystem services. We have started putting financial values on that. 
They not be, may not be the absolute right ones to do, but they're the best that we can work with at the moment. And that translates that value of the natural environment into a language which works with our decision makers internally, which works with our estate managers, which works with our finance teams as well. But there's also a tool which allows us to create different scenarios for managing our land and be able to measure and monitor the change in that value as you undertook that, that particular change. It's also become a really good way in terms of constructing scenarios to engage with our stakeholders on the land. We can have our view of what might, what might change by investing in that natural capital, changing the flow of services, but really in terms of engaging people on the ground is how we start to refine that, understanding their view, understanding the best things to be able to do to optimise that. And those stakeholders could be the wildlife trusts, in this case it was Natural England, local farmers as well, to how we actually manage uh, that uh, particular piece of land. So out of that, what we've been doing is developing and refining management plans. How does that work? How do we do carry out the changes in our natural capital? How does that ecosystem services flow? Turning that into long-term management plans that engage and involve partners in terms of managing our land for us on our behalf and turning that into um, uh, new outcomes. For example, is just a little bit of wildflower meadow, which is publicly accessible in our uh, area, in, a, in one of our sites. Just as an example, here's one that we've been working on for a while now with Yorkshire Wildlife Trust, our Thought Marsh substation. Um, we worked with the Wildlife Trust to develop, in this case, a three-year management plan starting to manage those land holdings in a different way, which optimise grassland, wetland habitat around our substation, uh, some of the lines, just uh, uh, some of the areas where we're actively working on. But in a way that encourages and involves communities, there's more, much more public access, there's information and interpretation boards going up um, to bring that area to life and also to leverage the existing activities of the Wildlife Trust which they have a reserve just to the top left of that picture as well so connecting those two areas um, but in a way that preserves and enhances the features we need from that that land holding for us but also delivers real long-term benefits to the, the Wildlife Trusts as well. We have this approach working now in over 20 sites, which we've uh, been working on for the past sort of two and a half years or so. In Derbyshire, one of the sites we've mentioned, we're managing our land to enhance our area of a, what is recently notified Triple SI, um, encouraging public access, giving, putting in information boards showing why that particular area is important, what it actually means to people. We are the one in Worcestershire. We're working hand in hand with wildlife trusts, with butterfly conservation, and a local farmer who's interested in conservation grazing to really bring that um, free party of partnership approach to enhancing that site. In Sheffield, one of our sites in an urban area is next to a college. They're taking over that land and using it for growing areas, for um, supporting courses in, in arboriculture, landscape planning and, and so on, using those resources in different ways. And we have a, a network, a small network of environmental education centres cited on these kinds of areas as well, bringing both school groups and adult groups to outdoor learning experiences um, on our substation sites. So that's really about trying to build that much better uh, natural environment around our sites. Next stage is about how do we do bigger. How do we uh, look at some of our surplus land estates? And here's an area, this is an old gas holder site. This is very much not an AONB. This is up in the, the northwest. This is a site about 20 hectares, sorry, 20 acres, um, which was associated with the old gas holder, which is due for demolition now. And this was very much an under, undervalued and pretty much a neglected asset. 
but it's actually right on the doorstep of an area of very high social deprivation and urban sprawl. So what we've been doing is working with the local authorities, local councils, with the Forestry Commission and a community group to actually now convert this, start building this over the next three years into a community woodland with public access, engaging the communities in uh, developing and designing that and uh, providing access to it. So starting to build up bigger spaces for, for nature and communities. Next part is about connected. How do we connect? How do we use our linear assets for those wildlife connections which uh, came out, which were talked so much following the, the Lawton report? By and large, you probably know we do not own the land under or over our assets. So this is very much about how do we work in agreement and in collaboration with landowners uh, around those assets. But where we've been able to have that agreement, where we've been able to work with people, we've been finding much more creative ways of using that land around the, the assets. Um, yeah, let's do there. Um, some cattle grazing. The one at the bottom there, this is quite a large lake area in northwest London. But the islands, the, the pylons sit there on little islands, they're creating new little bits of habitat through that, that uh, water environment there. But the one on the left I think is quite interesting in that what you can plant in and around or under or over our uh, systems is quite controlled. But here, you may be able to see these are just saplings now being planted. This is an orchard growing under a span of overhead lines. Specially selected species that don't grow to a above a particular height, but will turn out to be a highly productive uh, orchard in the years to come. The other sort of areas where our systems and environment can be difficult is vegetation management, particularly in wooded areas. So we have a, a duty to manage vegetation, manage trees around our um, overhead lines to reduce risk, but to ensure security of supply. And these tend to leave very sharp edges or can leave very sharp edges down the end of particularly of managed uh, plantation, tree plantations. But how can you start being much more creative around the way you, you plant there? The picture on the, the left there is actually a collaboration we're working on with the Belgian transmission owner called Elia, and this is actually purposely planting with the landowners fringing habitats to soften the transition between the wood and the uh, overhead line corridor there. And in the middle, you can't quite see, but there's a, a digger truck. It's about to start stripping back the uh, soil there to create a pond but also to re-establish the heathland um, habitat that was there before the overhead line. The one on the right there is in the UK, it's in West Sussex. And again, you can see this much softer profile there, selecting the right plants, reducing the need for vegetation management, in many cases actually removing it, but also concentrating on what's planted underneath. And that heathland now is a real rich nightingale habitat. Okay, so around our overhead lines. So we believe there are lots of opportunities for more creative uh, working and planting and management of vegetation and the environment around our overhead lines. So just to sort of draw this to a close, we're developing, we're building this natural grid approach. We have 20 odd um, sites going on our fixed, our existing land holdings. Uh, we have at least 10 more in the pipeline this year, working in partnership with others to realise that shared value from our land holdings. As we develop new sites, change sites, we've put in place the tools, our natural capital and ecosystem service accounting, so we can measure where our impacts are and offset and actually add net positive gain as we restore and mitigate. Where I think is actually becoming much more interesting is around the high value landscapes and Hector was talking about the great work that's going on around the visual impact program um, and how undergrounding can really help. What is probably the biggest impact there around visual impact? And I think some of the principles that we're applying in the natural grid have real um, 
opportunities to be applied through the Landscape Enhancement Initiative. But we're also embedding this in the way we approach major infrastructure delivery, how we engage with our stakeholders, with our consultees, to think about how we build this proactively into new infrastructure delivery. So that was pretty much all I wanted to say, uh, but just to acknowledge some of those collaborations and growing collaborations, working with ACOM, the World Council for Business Sustainability. We work with the Prince's Trust Accounting for Sustainability Network and lots of very uh, good collaborations, particularly with the Wildlife Trusts, TCV, Groundwork, Butterfly Conservation and a few others there. So that's all I'd like wanted to, to say. If anyone wants to get in contact, there's a huge long email address there, uh, but that is looked at on a daily basis. So thank you for your attention.